Good morning, everyone. Thank you so much for joining the Fulbright Foreign Student Program presentation. Wherever you are, I hope you're having a really good day. My name is Abby Greenwell. I'm with the Institute of International Education, and my role here is uh, Fulbright advisor to um, Fulbright foreign students who have come from all over the world, specifically to the Mid-Atlantic region. Um, so I'm here to talk more about the program, and my colleague is here as well. Hi, I'm Jordana Enrich, and I am Assistant Director of the Fulbright U.S. Scholar Program at the Council for International Exchange of Scholars, which is a division of the Institute of International Education. Before assuming this role, I would actually work I was assistant director in the University Placement Services Division, which places foreign Fulbright students in U.S. universities. So I'm here to talk more about my role in placement and um, the opportunities um, in the foreign Fulbright student program. Um, first, we'll go through an overview of what our presentation is going to cover today. Um, we will cover the Fulbright program on a broader scale, and then we'll talk about stakeholders in the program. As well, we'll discuss the Institute of International Education, which is our organization, and a little bit more about what the Institute does. Next, we'll cover Fulbright grant details. Um, Sorry, I'll make it full screen so you all can see our, our slides full screen. And then we'll talk about application and selection, which I'm sure you're particularly interested in. Uh, and then placement of grantees at American universities, pre-academic programs that are available for Fulbright students, um, what in-country support you would be eligible for if you were a Fulbrighter, and a little bit about what Fulbright enrichment activities um, are available. Just um, a little bit of housekeeping. I think it's best if you save your questions until the end of our presentation and then you can chat them in. We will then read out uh, questions out loud um, and answer them out loud. So there will be time at the end. So just jot down your questions as we're going through the presentation. The Fulbright program um, was sort of the idea of Senator J. William Fulbright um, shortly after World War II. And the idea of the Fulbright program is that it's, it's there to promote mutual understanding between peoples of the United States and other countries. The Fulbright program is administered um, or basically available in over 150 countries worldwide. And there are many different um, facets to the Fulbright program. So for instance, today we're going to talk about the foreign student program, but there's also a US component. So US students can um, participate in the Fulbright program and perhaps uh, go to your country um, through that program. And then there's the US and foreign scholar program. So Jordana was saying how she, she works currently with scholars and that's available for US scholars. So um, PhDs and professionals in their field to go overseas and also for PhDs and professionals to come here through that program. Then we have the Fulbright Language Teaching Assistance Program and um, that is for like language teachers to come here to US institutions and um, teach their language and also help set up programs in US institutions that might not have that language available. And then last, we should say that there are approximately 4,000 students that receive grants annually for, through the Foreign Fulbright Program. The Fulbright stakeholders are the J. William Fulbright Foreign Scholarship Board, which is a presidentially appointed board here in Washington, and they actually have the, the final sign-off um, for applications, and they're, they're tasked with establishing the policies of the program. Then we have the U.S. Department of State Bureau of Educational and Cultural Affairs, or in shorthand, as we call it ECA. Um, they basically run the program in the State Department and work with administering agencies such as IIE to, to run the program. So um, the Department of State is funded by Congress. They, they get an appropriation from the U.S. Congress. Um, and they also do cost sharing. They work on cost sharing with binational commissions and governments overseas. So the program, while it's a broad worldwide program, you should think of it on a binational level. So 
policies in different countries will be different depending on that country's agreement with the United States. As well, um, U.S. institutions and, and international institutions also provide some funding for the Fulbright program. So we have a lot of different stakeholders um, all working through the Fulbright program. And um, last, you'll see at the bottom the three um, logos, basically, of the administering agencies of the Fulbright program. So the Institute of International Education is in the middle, but also LASPAO and Ahmed East um, help administer parts of the program. So the Institute of International Education is a nonprofit organization that was founded in 1919, and the organization is dedicated to international educational and professional exchange, um, and is one of the administering agencies of the Fulbright program, which Abby just mentioned. Um, it started administering the Fulbright program on behalf of the Department of State in cooperation with M U.S. embassies and Fulbright commissions in 1946. We have 32 offices globally, and we manage more than 250 different programs in 175 different countries. Um, so in addition to the Fulbright program, we also administer many other international exchange programs on behalf of other U.S. government agencies and private businesses um, and a variety of other different programs. And IIE has a staff of approximately 650 worldwide. So the Fulbright grant is an agreement between the U.S. government and your home country. Um, there are 150 countries that participate in the Fulbright program, and the program can vary a lot depending on the country. So you'll hear throughout our presentation, we can't really speak in black and white because the program has so many different facets and policies, so everything is very variable. Um, so the policies of the Fulbright programs often vary depending on the country's priorities. Um, so some countries may prioritize offering grants in certain fields of study, such as, um, such as STEM fields, science, technology, engineering, and math. Um, and other countries may focus on other fields, such as art or film. Um, some countries offer five-year grants, and other countries may offer one-year grants. Um, there are even different grants within the same country. So a country may offer a Fulbright grant for master's study and a different Fulbright grant for PhD study. Um, and these two grants have very different funding parameters and different time frames. Um, so we're going to go into the contact information in a little bit, but if you have questions about the types of grants that your country offers, it's best to inquire with your home country when you're determining the benefits of the Fulbright grant and if there are multiple grants offered in your country um, and they can help advise which is the best for you to apply to. Um, so the Fulbright grant includes visa sponsorship. So if selected, you would come to the U.S. on a J-1 visa. Um, you would also receive U.S. government-sponsored health insurance while you're on your grant in the U.S. Um, and generally, the Fulbright grant comes with funding, and this funding can come from a variety of sources. Um, Abby talked about the different stakeholders in the Fulbright program, and those stakeholders really come into play um, when talking about funding. So um, the principal funders of the Fulbright program are the U.S. government, um, and also your home country government often um, will give money. And the U.S. universities also um, provide funding to contribute to the Fulbright Grant. So depending on the country um, that you're from, your Fulbright funding may include all of these funding sources or just one of them. Um, and in some countries, if the Fulbright funds in combination with any university awards you would be receiving um, are not sufficient, 
you may have to contribute personal funds if that's allowed by your home country. And this really varies depending on the country you come from. Um, the Foreign Fulbright Program generally offers grants to pursue a master's or a PhD. Um, there are also some grants available to pursue research. So if you're currently a PhD student in your home country, um, the Fulbright grant may um, have an opportunity for you to pursue four to 10 months of re research here um, in the US while you're finishing your PhD in your home country. Um, the Fulbright grant offerings really vary depending on the country. So again, we wanna encourage you to check with your um, home country about which grants um, they offer in terms of whether it's master's, PhD, or vis visiting student research opportunities. So in order to apply, um, for a Fulbright Award, you must apply in your home country. And the Fulbright program is administered in your country by either a binational Fulbright Commission or the U.S. Embassy. So it depends on, on what country you are applying in. Um, the link that we're displaying um, will give you the contact information by country. So when you go to that link, you select which country um, you're coming from, and that will give you the correct contact information. You'll most likely apply using an online application, um, and the selection for Fulbright grantees is held in the home country. So each country handles selections a little differently, but they'll generally create a panel in the country that reviews applications, um, and there's often an interview component as well. Once the country has made their final selections, the US State Department reviews the final panelists, and the Fulbright Foreign Scholarship Board gives the final approval. And this is that presidentially appointed board that Abby mentioned earlier. Um, many countries select principals and alternates um, as well. So I talked about um, my role in the University Placement Services Division, so I wanted to go into more detail about that. Many countries that participate in the Fulbright program use IIE's University Placement Services. Not all, though, so again, this will really vary depending on the country. Um, University Placement Services Division <coughs> is a team at IIE that's organized by field of study. And they, we help applicants expand their understanding of U.S. higher education. And ultimately, we submit applications on your behalf to U.S. universities. So um, this team evaluates your application and applies to anywhere from four to six universities on your behalf that match your study objective, your interests, and your academic profile. Um, we, this unit is really committed to what we call academic matchmaking and finding you the best possible place to pursue your master's degree or PhD or, or your um, research, depending on what you've been nominated for in your home country. After the placement team submits applications on your behalf, they work with the universities to secure, to try to secure cost sharing if possible. So that's when we ask the universities to consider giving financial awards to Fulbright applicants. Could be in the form of a partial tuition waiver or um, maybe an assistantship. And um, this money then um, coincides with the Fulbright grant you've been given um, and that will help fund your entire Fulbright experience. Um, the placement unit also finalizes the admission offer on your behalf with the U.S. University so that everything is set to go um, when you arrive in the U.S. Okay, so you made it through the selection process. Congratulations. So the next step is um, you will be placed in a pre-academic program depending upon the, the, the country decision and sort of the, the work that they do with IIE. So um, some students will get to attend a gateway orientation. So that is prior to starting your academic pro program, you all, a bunch of students will meet at a, at a certain location at the US institution, and they're about five days in length, and they're offered for first year students. Um, IIE works 
directly with various host institutions um, to deliver important information on um, culture shock, on plagiarism, on personal and computer safety, as well as basic introductions to the U.S. academic um, higher education um, field and culture. So that's a really exciting time. Um, a lot of the students have just literally arrived off the plane, and there are all sorts of fun activities, um, both where important information for your Fulbright grant is conveyed, but also there are different cultural events. So you might go to visit a museum or a nice restaurant or something in the area. Then um, students also, some students are selected for pre-academic language programs, and this is determined on a variety of factors, which Jordana can probably talk about more, but um, it it's, depends on your English skills, of course, and your skills in the field of study that you've chosen. Um, so there's various fields of study training. For instance, we have LLM training. So people who are coming to do their LLM here might be selected to do a pre-academic program prior to their arrival on campus, which um, will help them sort of hit the ground running once they get to their U.S. institution. Um, objectives of the pre-academic language programs are to really reinforce the Fulbright identity. So what does it mean to be a Fulbrighter? Because you could just come here on an exchange and just be here focused on your academic studies, but really being a Fulbrighter, which we haven't really mentioned, but it is also part of um, your, your objective is to be a representative of your country to the U.S. So um, it's about public diplomacy and really sharing your country with the peoples of the United States. Um, so also you'll get language training or any other um, training necessary to begin your program and start hit the ground running. Again, not all students will um, participate in these programs, but these are some programs that, that may be available to you. Um, once you're in country, this really hits on sort of the job that I do with my students in the, in the Washington, D.C. and Mid-Atlantic region of the United States. Once they arrive, I send them a welcome, a, a welcome email, which contains um, information about their arrival, information about their Fulbright program, and information about how they can get a hold of me. Um, then, so this is basically when you're matched with a Fulbright advisor, and that's done regionally. Um, so, for instance, people who are on the West Coast will probably have a different advisor, one that's probably closer to you, because another part of our job is to visit your campuses once you're placed. So, um, we'll visit your campus, perhaps meet with you individually, but also we might hold a, a cultural event or um, a potluck when we get there. Just for you to get to meet other Fulbrighters on campus and also to get to see me in person. Um, so that's really helpful. And then our role also is to be a li liaison for your host institution and for you on campus. Um, so we can help work out any sort of um, issues or questions that you're having about your, your university or perhaps it's about a billing question or a credit question, we will be the liaison there. We, we often have walk-in and Skype office hours. Um, we're particularly using Skype office hours frequently now. Um, it's exciting to get to see students on a face-to-face -face basis if they aren't nearby, so they won't be able to come into our office. Um, we will be able to advise or clarify Fulbright policy. As we were mentioning earlier, Fulbright policy can vary from country to country as far as what you're able to um, participate in or do while you're here on your Fulbright program. The advisor, the Fulbright advisor will monitor your academic progress in the program um, to make sure you're, you're you know, doing well in your program and progressing along in an expected way. We'll explain health benefits and claims to you. Um, we can also process requests, your requests for grant renewals or extensions. Um, perhaps you're interested in doing academic training or internships. Um, and then also any work authorization requests will work with you um, to get that approved. Then, um, as a part of the Fulbright program, 
you also have access to enrichment seminars, um, which are conducted during the spring semester of each academic year. And the Department of State sponsors the seminars um, for the first year for and full writers. Um, each seminar brings together 125 to 150 Fulbrighters from across the United States. Um, and it's an open interactive forum to discuss and learn about any given topic. Um, they usually last four days and they're at a specific site in the US. So for instance, we've had seminars that focus on um, entrepreneurship before, uh, climate change, um, political, issues in the United States. So they're all on a very interesting and relevant topic to today. Um, and that is done, basically the people are assigned to those programs in a way that makes sure that we have a diverse representation of Fulbrighters from across the US. So it often sparks very interesting conversations when people are coming together from different field of study backgrounds to meet and discuss this specific topic. Um, as well, we have the IIE Cultural Events Desk in New York City, so Fulbrighters can contact them. Um, for instance, if you're traveling to New York City or if you're posted in New York City, you can contact them for free tickets, um, cultural events information in the city. Um, and then there's One to World, which is a nonprofit organization that works with really all members of the international community, but they offer special cultural enrichment activities for Fulbrighters. And then we have the Fulbright Alumni Association. That is an independent, so they're independent of IIE, um, nonprofit membership organization, and they organize events uh, in various locations in the United States. I know in Washington, DC, we have a very um, active Fulbright Alumni Association. So all that being said, um, in the regional offices, we also independently organize cultural events. For instance, in our Washington, D.C. office, we've had, um, we had an ice cream social to welcome students to the area in September. Um, we've had a, a National Mall Monument Tour. And um, we have a different uh, forum where students can come and give a presentation on the research that they're working on. And that happens two or three times a year. So, you know, you have all of these cultural enrichment activities available to you, but even the, the regional offices also have additional activities because this, go back, this goes back to the mission of Fulbright, right? Because Fulbright is both an academic program, but also a cultural program. So. Um, we want you to share your culture with us, but to also learn about the culture of the United States. Um, All right, so that is that. Those are the basics of the Fulbright program. Um, I know that we're going to have a lot of questions on specifics for your country. Uh, we will try to answer those questions as best we can, but more often than not, you're probably going to hear us refer you to this website that's posted here, which is foreign.fulbrightonline.org forward slash applicants. That's where you can get linked to the specific information for your country and learn more about what's available for your specific country. Um, so let's just take one moment to um, go through the questions. So the, one of the questions is, um, I'm from Vietnam, which grants are available to me? So this, I'm going to refer you to the website. Um, on this website is where you'll find the information about what grants are available specifically for you in Vietnam. Again, there are over 150 different programs of the Fulbright program, so uh, countries of the Fulbright program. So you'll want to go specifically to that website. Um, OK. Does the program apply to students from Belarus? Uh, you will need to go on the website to learn more information about what's available to you if you live in Belarus. Um, here's another question. Can I do research only during my Fulbright grant? So if you're interested in doing research only, actually, again, this is going to be another question answer where you need to go to your 
country's um, website for more information about if you can do a research only grant while you're in the United States. And another question that just came in, um, what is a J-1 visa? Um, the J-1 visa is the visa that you would be coming on um, as part of the Fulbright program, and it's the exchange visitor non-immigrant visa category for individuals who are approved to participate in work and study-based exchange visitor programs. So the exchange visitor program um, gl fosters global understanding through educational and cultural exchanges. And all exchange visitors that come on the J-1 visa are expected to return to their home country upon completion of their program in order to share their exchange experiences. So this is what Abby was talking about. The Fulbright program is a cultural exchange program. So along with that, um, there is a visa requirement that requires you to return to your home country for two years. Um, so we have a more specific question from someone saying they would like to pursue a master's degree in structural in engineering. I got a bachelor's degree in civil engineering from Yangon Technical University in Myanmar in 2008. Um, and I have a score of an IELTS overband score of 7.0. Is that sufficient for the application for postgraduate degree? So I'll let her down to answer that. <laughs> yeah, and I, it's hard to answer these questions specifically, but it does look like you have a great background to begin the process. So um, we're, you know, we're looking for um, applicants in a variety of fields, and we do want to make sure that your English abilities are up to par in order to participate in a U.S academic degree program. Um, but again, you'll need to apply through your home country. Um, some countries may be looking to select uh, students in engineering fields and others may be looking in other fields. So um, we encourage you to apply and, um, you know, depending on your background, um, I think if you are selected, you a uh, bachelor's in structural engineering with an IELTS of 7.0 is, is a really great uh, background to have. So we have a lot of questions for Jordana <laughs> for her hat as a, as a previous placement officer. So the uh, question is, how is the university selected for a particular candidate? Um, what criteria? Um, what is it to mention an essay to help Fulbright staff choose the program? This is a great question. Um, what we do in the placement team is we evaluate your study objectives. So when you apply for the Fulbright program, you're asked to write a study objective and a personal statement. So when we're reviewing your application, we're looking at your study objective to see what you want to study. And you know, we encourage you to be as detailed as possible if there's specializations, for instance, within structural engineering that you want to focus on. We ask that you write about those because that will help us in doing our research to figure out the best program for you. So in addition to looking at what you want to pursue, we're looking at your academic profile. So we're looking at your GRE scores, your either IELTS or TOEFL scores. We're looking at your grades um, from your undergraduate degree. And all of this will help us come up with a list of four to six universities where we're going to apply on your behalf. But the most important thing is that we want to find a university that's doing the academic work that you're interested in. So there's not a separate essay required for Fulbright staff because we use your personal statement and your study objective to evaluate your interests and then craft a list of university options for you. Thanks. So we have another question. I am Filipino, but I am currently residing in South Korea. Can I apply in Fulbright Korea? So what we generally advise is that you should visit the application information for your home country. So for the country where you're a citizen of or where you were born, you should vi visit that, um, that country description first. So I do encourage you, if you're Filipino, you should look at the Philippines um, country description to apply. And in that country description, they might have more information about their requirements and eligibility for the program. For instance, um, 
do you need to be a citizen of that country? Um, how long should you have resided in that country? So for instance, if you've been living in South Korea, the description may or may not have information about um, you know, time abroad and if that will hurt or help you in your application. So again, it's, you should visit the, the website for where you're a citizen of. That's a great question. And another question came in, how many Fulbright grants does each country give out? So this really varies depending on the country. Um, some countries have funding to give out 150 awards and some countries may only have funding for one or two awards. So this is going to depend on your home country and they may be able to give you um, kind of statistics on how many grants they're able to offer in a given year. Another good question came in, can you change majors while on the grant? Um, so generally the answer is no, right? Because you get a full right to pursue a specific degree. Um, if you are you know, encountering difficulties or finding that your interests are really changing while you're here, that's something that you need to bring to your advisor's attention and discuss more in depth. Because of course it's situational, but Basically, you won't be able to change majors, especially if it's a drastic change while you're in the program. But again, you know, people's interests change, we understand, so that's a discussion you would have once you arrive. And another question came in. Um, you mentioned principles and alternates. Can you talk more about that? Um, so some countries may select principles and alternates, and if a principal is not able to go, this could then create room for an alternate to be what we call upgraded to principal. Um, in addition, if maybe the country was making decisions on certain funding parameters and then more funding becomes available throughout the year, they may be able to upgrade um, a, um, an alternate. So, um, this is, this is the country's, um, the home countries will make those decisions on how many principles and alternates um, they are able to select. And generally alternates go through the same placement process so that they have applications out to the universities in case they are upgraded to, to principal. Um, this question sort of goes uh, off those lines. It says, during the presentation, you said once the country makes the selection, do the guys from my country decide on my future before the guys from the U.S. committee get a chance to interview me? So um, depending on your country, most countries have a very uh, international selection committee, right? So you submit your application, and an international selection committee is reviewing you. But it is reviewed in your home country. Um, but for instance, there are often American citizens on that board that review applications. There's um, U.S. Embassy staff, perhaps, some um, academics from your home country. Maybe there's a visiting Fulbrighter from the U.S. that perhaps is on that committee. So it's a, generally a committee of people that are reviewing the applications in your home country. And then, as Georgiana mentioned, they are then making the um, recommendations for, uh, you know, recommended candidates, which are the ones they really suggest highly, the alternate candidates, and then the non-recommended. So they aren't making the final selection, certainly, but their um, opinions on that first review um, do get forwarded to the U.S. for review and are considered highly in the process. So I know that sounds a bit confusing, but of course, if you have any questions about the selection committee process in your home country, you should contact the uh, office there specifically for that information. And the next question is, do you have a business program? And again, this is going to depend on the country you're applying in. Um, we do have a lot of foreign Fulbright students that pursue um, degrees in business, um, but it could be, it depends on, on your country and your country may be selecting um, grantees in business one year and then they may not the next year. Um, so, um, so this will really depend on the country. And, and going along with that, the question that came in is, can you apply for a grant if I am at an MBA in the US? And generally, you would need the home countries where you're applying will have um, 
will have kind of guidelines on how long you need to have resided in your home country or how long you have, were able to be outside of your home country. So generally speaking, those that are currently getting degrees in the U.S. might not be eligible this year um, for a Fulbright, but we encourage you to look at um, the web link to get the contact information for your home country because your home country will have certain guidelines on who can apply for the Fulbright program and who is eligible to apply. So this is a question saying, during the play presentation, you said placement comes after selection. Aren't I supposed to already know where I'll be studying before being selected, or at least have two to three options where I want to study? This is a great question because I think the Fulbright program may differ from other grants available in that you are not necessarily responsible for finding a selection before or finding a university placement before the selection. So the, um, we want you to look at your home country for the application deadline because generally the application deadline is almost a full year before you would um, actually come to the U.S. So you would need to be selected as a Fulbright grantee um, in your home country and then your application materials are forwarded to the placement team so that they so that you can be reviewed for um, your application to go to U.S. universities. So yes, you do need to be selected in your home country first, and then the placement step happens after you're selected. I'm an adult expat returning to school in the U.S. I have been enrolled as a U.S. international student. Um, in an academic, I don't know what that says, even though I have a U.S. passport, would I be eligible for a foreign student or a U.S. student program? Can I be eligible at all? So if you're a, if you're a U.S. citizen and you're um, in the U.S. right now or even abroad um, and have been abroad for an extensive amount of time, you should you cannot apply as a foreign student. Um, so that's not something you could do. If you're, I mean, you could look at applying within the U.S. to go to another country, perhaps, but there are some rules about experience abroad, et cetera. So this might not be the best program for you. Um, so yeah, if you're a U.S. citizen, you cannot apply for the foreign uh, student program. Thank you for that question. Um, let's see what else. Um, okay. There's another question. Um, how much money does a Fulbright grant provide? <laughs> this, I mean, this is like an important question, right? Because you're here to learn about financial information for going to school in the U.S. Um, unfortunately, again, we're not the best resource um, as there are over 150 different Fulbright grant benefit packages available. And it depends on your country, but it, even within a country, it can depend on what program within that country or award you're applying to. So uh, to look at more information about what benefits are available to you during in a Fulbright grant, please do go to your home country's website. I know we keep hitting that hard, but um, it's really important to understand the binational nature of the Fulbright program. Um, people would like to think it's just, you know, the same program. Everyone does the same thing, but it's not. It's really reflective of the diversity of the world in that, you know, every country might have a different program. Every country might have different awards available within that program. And uh, the next question is, um how to log into the website and the website you would get a login once you're selected as a Fulbright grantee but um, if for right now you would want to select your home country and then look at the contact information so you're not given a login until you're actually selected as a Fulbrighter um, but then after that uh, but then for right now you can use the website to find contact information um, the next question is, what exam is better to pass, the GRE or the GMAT? Um, this is a great question. This really depends on um, what field of study you are pursuing. So generally, the GMAT is for um, business students, and the GRE is for um, all other academic programs. So if you're applying, if you're interested in applying to um, a business school as part of the Fulbright grant, you should look into the GMAT. But if it's um, a different kind of academic program, then I would look at the GRE. 
more and more business schools are actually taking the GRE instead of the GMAT, but generally speaking, the GMAT um, is geared towards uh, those pursuing business degrees. Um, the next question is, should I have a TOEFL or IELTS certificate to apply? Um, and this is a great question as well. A lot of U.S. institutions are accepting both the TOEFL and the IELTS. Um, I would say, generally speaking, more U.S. universities accept the TOEFL than the IELTS. Um, more and more universities are accepting the IELTS, but since the TOEFL is a U.S. administered English language program and the IELTS is a British administered um, English language test, um, generally the TOEFL is more accepted, but more and more we're seeing more U.S. universities accept the IELTS. Um, this is another question for you, I'm afraid. Um, what role does the home institution play in the placement process? Um, so that's a good question, and I think by home institution you mean um, the maybe the U, the U, university you're um, maybe doing your bachelor's degree in, or um, I'm not sure if you mean by home institution the home country where you're applying. So your your institution where you're doing your bachelor's or undergraduate degree would not really play a role in the placement process. But your um, home country, the either the Fulbright Commission or the U.S. Embassy, um, does play a little role. We usually um, work with the Fulbright Commissions or the U.S. Embassies when we are um, suggesting that list of universities to you. We're going to really work with um, the home, your home country um, Fulbright office to make sure that they're in agreement with this list that we're suggesting. So, so they really are a key stakeholder in that process. Um, we have a question saying, does the Fulbright still offer scholarship program for 2014-15? If so, when is the deadline? Yes, um, there are programs offered for 2014-15. Of course, um, I'm not sure you didn't put what country um, you'd be applying from, but depending on your country, they might have a different deadline. So I, again, I really encourage you to go to this website, um, born.fulbrightonline.org slash applicants and look for it by your country and then you can see when the deadline is for 2014-15 applications. Um, we're getting to where it might be a little bit late in the process um, so you might have to actually wait until 2015-16 applications are announced. Um, just because 2014 is about six months away. So I, I don't know what the requirements are for your country, so you should look at that. But um, if not for 2014-15, do look when they're announced for 2015-16. And generally, the you want to be thinking about a year in advance. So, um, so look at your home country for that deadline information. Um, is the Fulbright Foreign Student Program valid for Indian students? Uh, yes, I know that India does have um, a, a very active Fulbright program, so you should, again, visit this website and search uh, the countries available by India, and you'll find what programs are available uh, for you there. Okay, yeah, this, these are, we're getting more deadline questions. Does the deadline vary by, by country program? And it does. Um, what are the prerequisites for undergraduate studies? So this is a good question. The Fulbright program is generally for, math, for um, graduate students. So you would not be pursuing a Fulbright for undergraduate studies. Um, you would be um, usually eligible to apply for Fulbright once you've finished your undergraduate studies in your home country. And then you would be applying to either do master's, PhD, or maybe some visiting research. Um, while you're in the U.S., but that's all geared towards graduate degrees. Um, this question is, are applications done exclusively through the basis of nationality? Um, I think what your question is, is through the basis of citizenship, where should you apply? So depending on where you're a citizen of, you should look at the requirements for your citizen country on the Fulbright program. So. What this means is it's a binational program, so you should apply through your home country. Um, 
So let's see, we have another question. Can I do an internship when on the Fulbright program? Um, this <laughs> is a question, again, it depends. It depends on the country policies of your Fulbright program. Um, once you arrive in the country, your advisor will be the best one to contact about whether or not you are a eligible and able to do an internship or work while in the United States. Um, so please do, um, you, that's a question you can of course ask to your home country office, but also once you arrive in the United States, your Fulbright advisor, I would um, be advising you on if you can do an internship, if so, um, what internships are available to you. And you do need to get approval, of course, prior to starting an internship if you're eligible to do that. Um, the next question that's coming in is, is about whether you would apply for the Fulbright Student Program or the Fulbright Scholar Program, depending on where you are in your career. And um, this question is coming from a computer science student who's working on their master's study um, and finishing, it looks like, or doing research for their master's thesis. So generally, the Fulbright Scholar Program is um, more geared towards professionals and academics that um, may have a PhD. Um, so if you are finishing your master's but you don't have a lot of years of work experience, um, you will probably be considered for the student program, but you would, um, the student program is generally available for those seeking degrees. So I think this would depend on if you're interested in pursuing a PhD in the US, then you would definitely be applying under the Fulbright student program. And again, the specifics of who is eligible for the student program versus the scholar program can be um, found out in your home country. So make sure to inquire with your home country when determining whether you're eligible for the Fulbright student or Fulbright scholar program. So it looks like um, we've reached the end of the questions that have been typed in. Um, I think that We've addressed everything um, in our presentation that, that we can think of. So thank you for the really great questions. Thank you for your interest in the Fulbright Foreign Student Program. And um, we welcome, uh, hopefully we'll see you all someday soon. So have a, have a good day and thank you for joining us. Thanks so much.